Hello everyone, this is the CircuitPython weekly meeting for August the 29th, 2022. Uh, this is the time of the week where we get together to talk about all things CircuitPython. My name is Tim and I am sponsored by Adafruit to work on CircuitPython. CircuitPython is a version of Python that's designed to run on tiny computers called microcontrollers. Uh, CircuitPython development is primarily sponsored by Adafruit, so if you want to support them and the CircuitPython project, consider purchasing hardware from Adafruit.com. This meeting is hosted on the Adafruit Discord server. You can join anytime by going to adafru.it slash discord. We hold the meeting in the CircuitPython dev text channel as well as the CircuitPython voice channel. This meeting typically occurs Mondays at 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific, except when that coincides with a U.S. holiday. In the notes doc, there's a link to a calendar you can view online or add it to your favorite calendar app. We also send notifications about upcoming meetings via Discord. If you would like to receive these notifications, ask us to add you to the CircuitPythonistas role over on Discord. There is a notes doc that accompanies the meeting and recording. The notes document contains timestamps to go along with the video, so uh, you can use the doc to skip around and view the parts that interest you most. Uh, after each meeting, we'll post the link to the next meeting's notes document in the CircuitPython dev channel on the Adafruit Discord. Uh, you can always check the pinned messages there to find the latest notes doc throughout the week. And uh, you are free, of course, to add your hug reports and status updates throughout the week if you think of them early. Uh, if you wish to participate but can't attend, uh, you can leave your hug reports and status updates in that document for us to read um, during the meeting. Uh, uh, on to uh, the meeting structure. This meeting will get held in five parts. The first part is going to be community news. This is a look at uh, all things CircuitPython and Python on hardware from uh, in the community. It's a preview, a sneak peek, if you will, of the Python on microcontrollers newsletter. The second part is the state of CircuitPython, the libraries in Blinka. This one is a statistical overview of the entire project. It's a chance to look at the project by the numbers, separate from what we're all up to. The next part uh, is Hug Reports. This is the first of our two round robins. Hug Reports is an opportunity to highlight the good things folks are doing, uh, take time to recognize awesome folks in our community and beyond. The fourth part and uh, final uh, round robin section is the status update section. Status updates is an opportunity to sync up on what we've been up to. Take a few minutes to talk about what you've been doing since the last week and what you plan to work on um, in the next week until the next meeting. And then the fifth and final part rounding things out is In the Weeds. Uh, in the Weeds is an opportunity for more long form discussions. These can come out of status updates or they can be topics identified ahead of time as too long for status updates. So that covers how the meeting will go. Um, so we'll get into our first one of those sec sections, which is the community news section. Uh, this week in community news, first item we have is uh, check out the simulator in beta for the micro bit Python editor. Uh, a simulator is now available within the beta micro bit Python editor. This allows you to try your code before sending it to the micro bit. The developers are fine tuning it over the next few weeks, so send them feedback and help make it even better. Uh, this comes to us from the micro bit newsletter, and there is a link uh, to that in the notes doc for the meeting. And of course, this will be in the newsletter when it uh, gets sent out tomorrow. Next up, we have uh, the MicroPython form migration uh, over to GitHub Discussions. So after close to nine years, the MicroPython team has decided to close their form in favor of moving over to GitHub dis Discussions. Uh, we have a link here to the actual MicroPython form post, as well as a link to the new home for these discussions over on GitHub. Uh, next up, we have uh, PyBricks, Python for Lego. PyBricks is Python coding for smart Lego hubs. Run MicroPython scripts directly on the hub and get full control over your motors and sensors. Py, uh, excuse me, PyBricks runs on Lego Boost, City, Technic, Mindstorms, and Spike. You can code it using Windows, Mac, Linux, Chromebook, and Android. Uh, it's released under MIT open source license, and you can find more information at pybricks.com. Next up, we have uh, editor news. Uh, there is a new, I believe, plugin for VS Code. Uh, so VS Code is going to be able to upload your code using the new CircuitPython 8 web workflow. Uh, Luke Williams is working on a task definition for, uh, excuse me, ta 
task definition and Python script to upload from VS Code to CircuitPython boards via the Web Workflow REST API. It's a work in progress at this time. Uh, it shows how leveraging new features in CircuitPython 8 can help development. And this uh, is a project which is being hosted uh, open source out on GitHub. Um, so there is a link to the GitHub repository here in the notes and a newsletter. Uh, next up, we have a new version of Thani. This is uh, Thani version 4.0.0. Thani 4.0.0 has emerged from beta with many changes and fixes. Uh, a main change is that they have dropped support for Python 3.5, 3.6, and 3.7. There are about two dozen changes for MicroPython and CircuitPython. You can learn more on the Thani releases page over on GitHub. Uh, next up, we have... Uh, Whippersnapper news. Uh, Whippersnapper has implemented custom component visualizations. Uh, Adafruit has introduced uh, some new gorgeous default Whippersnapper component visualizations and the ability for users to customize them. This comes to us from the Adafruit blog, so there's a link there to the blog post to learn more. Uh, a few of the features supported with this are custom labels, custom icons, uh, component contributors can set their default visualizations, uh, as well as I2C sensors uh, displaying the appropriate SI units. Uh, there are some new sensor types as well, and again, you can find more information on that over on the blog post. And the last one this week uh, from around the web, uh, a project from the community. Um, this one is a dragon frame clock. This is built with a Pimeroni hyperpixel round display and a Raspberry Pi 0W. It runs uh, with Python. Um, and I thought this was a really, really nice looking uh, clock display. So I couldn't resist adding it to our notes doc here for today. This is linked out on Twitter. Uh, and this comes to us from talktech.info, uh, the username on Twitter there. Uh, so there's a link over to Twitter as well as an image if anyone's interested in that. All right, so that gets us through the news items. I will wrap it up by telling you a bit more about the newsletter itself. The CircuitPython Weekly Newsletter is a CircuitPython community-run newsletter. It's emailed every Tuesday. The complete archives are available on adafruitdaily.com. It highlights the latest Python on hardware-related news from around the web, including CircuitPython, Python, and MicroPython developments. To contribute your own news or projects, you can edit next week's draft on GitHub. Uh, you can submit a pull request to the CircuitPython Weekly Newsletter repository. Um, or if you'd like, you can also tag a tweet with hashtag CircuitPython on Twitter or email to cpnews at adafruit.com. And uh, of course, as always, thank you to Anne for curating and uh, publishing the newsletter each week. Um, so next up, we will talk about the state of CircuitPython, the libraries in Blinka. Uh, overall, this week we had 68 pull requests merged uh, by 15 authors, which is great to see. Um, a couple of names which were new to me, so these folks are perhaps newer contributors or maybe just less frequent contributors or perhaps even just people who I didn't happen to see before. Uh, but a couple of those names are, uh, so let's see, Sokratisvas, uh, Vladek, uh, RSHAH713, Shing 2216, SG Baird, uh, Maxim Kolkin. Uh, Maxim Kolkin, yep. Those are the names again of folks that are either newer or less frequent contributors. Um, so thank you to those folks as well as all of our more regular uh, contributors. To go along with those 15 authors, we had 13 reviewers, which is also really great to see. Um, thank you to all of our reviewers. Um, it does look more or less on first glance to me like those are mostly the usual suspects. So thanks, of course, to everyone who does review for us. Um, we had, let's see, 68 closed issues by 18 people with 25 issues opened by 17 people. Uh, and this is across all of uh, everything, the core and the libraries. Uh, but next up, I will pass it over to uh, Dan, if you have a moment to tell us uh, more about the core individually. Sure, thanks. Okay, so in the core, we're talking about took a Python firmware itself. Um, uh, over the past week, there were 19 pull requests merged by seven authors, and there were five reviewers of those pull requests. Right now, we have 21 open pull requests, 
It's a little bit more than usual. Some of them are older. A lot of them are in draft form or awaiting something. So they're not um, just sort of uh, linger, languishing. They're something that has to happen to pull, push some of those forward. We had 13 closed issues by nine people and 13 opened issues by nine people. And they were different issues and different people, at least some different people. Um, right now, there are 556 open issues. Of that, uh, there are no open issues for 7.3.x. There are 39 open issues for 8.0. There, I think there were 36 last week. So we've had a, some more reports of new problems that we might want to fix for 8.0. We probably won't fix all of these for 8.0, but this is our, our optimistic hope to fix those 39. There are 22 open issues for libraries. And there are 494 uh, long-term issues, many of which are enhancements or discussions and the like. And there are three open issues for support. That in includes the support issues. And there are minus two issues assigned a milestone. Uh, obviously, our goal is to have many negative issues. Because what's the opposite of an issue? I'm not sure. OK. Uh, and if you want to look at these stats, you can find them at circuitpython.org stats. Okay. All right. Thanks, Dan. Uh, next up, I will pass it over to Katni if you want to tell us about the libraries. Thanks, Tim. So this applies to all of the Adafruit CircuitPython libraries, which is everything that starts with Adafruit underscore CircuitPython underscore, as well as a few extras. So this, this week, we had 48 pull requests merged, which is excellent, uh, from eight different authors and 10 different reviewers. Uh, one of those pull requests was 187 days old, so I'm really glad to see that we're still getting through uh, the older pull requests slowly but surely. And that leaves us with 23 open pull requests. Uh, we had 54 issues closed by 10 people and 11 opened by 7 people, so we are net very, very down, uh, leaving us with 637 open issues. 148 of those are good first issues. If you are interested in contributing to uh, CircuitPython on the Python side of things, check out circuitpython.org slash contributing. You'll find all of this information and more, including the list of open pull requests, um, the list of open issues, and um, uh, some library infrastructure issues as well. Um, we uh, have a guide on contributing to CircuitPython using Git and GitHub. So don't let that process intimidate you, and we are always available on Discord to help you out. If you're interested in reviewing, you can check out the open pull requests. If you have the hardware, test it. If you don't, take a look at the code, let us know what you think, uh, leave us a comment, and that is always helpful. And once you're comfortable with that, we can talk about leveling you up to the review team. In terms of library updates in the last seven days, we have two new libraries, TCA8418, and Adafruit CircuitPython GUVX I squared C are the two uh, updated or the two new libraries, and <clears throat> every library was updated uh, multiple times in the last week. So we don't have that massive list um, in the in the notes document uh, because it was just pages and pages of libraries. Um, and that's uh, what I've got. Excellent, thank you, Katni. Uh, next up, I will send it over to Maker Melissa to tell us about Blinka. Oh, so Blinka is our CircuitPython compatibility layer for MicroPython, Raspberry Pi, and other single board computers. And uh, this week we had one pull request merged by one author and one reviewer. There are currently four open pull requests. There was one closed issue by one person and one open by one person, leaving a net of 82 open issues. There were 11,821 Pi Wheels downloads in the last month, and we are now currently supporting 91 boards. And that's it. Excellent. Thank you, Melissa. Next up, we will start the first of our two round robins, the uh, Hug Reports section. Uh, let me scroll just a bit here. So a uh, reminder to folks, Hug Reports is a chance to highlight folks in the CircuitPython community and beyond for doing awesome things. I'll start and then we'll go down the list alphabetically and give everyone a chance to participate. Uh, if you're text only or missing the meeting, but have Hug Reports in the notes document, then I'll read them off as we get to your turn in the list. Uh, so I will kick us off here. Uh, this week I have Hug Reports. Uh, thank you to Liz, uh, who published a guide recently showing 
um, how to make an IoT dashboard uh, using the Blinka Display.io high game display, uh, which is a mouthful, but a, a neat library that um, I worked on. And it's great to see folks uh, making such neat things with it. So thank you to Liz for working on that and publishing it. Thank you to uh, Paul Cutler, uh, who converted a, a Fusion 360 model file for me uh, over the weekend. Definitely appreciated that. Give me a kickstart on what I was working on. Um, thank you to Kmatch for providing the hack tablets to give away, uh, as well as all the folks who entered to receive the hack tablets. Um, thank you to, uh, or I should say just hug report to, well, and thank you as well, uh, Tectric and Tammy for joining the Discord moderators team uh, over on the Discord. And then uh, my last one is a long list, but thank you to all of these folks. Uh, Keith the EE, Tectric, Tammy Makes Things, Paul Cutler, uh, Deshipu, Mark Gambler, and Katni, uh, and anybody else, if I did miss anybody, uh, for coordinating and organizing the office hours idea that we discussed in last week's meeting. I think that's a, a great idea, and we've got uh, a plan moving forward for that. So thank you to all those folks. Um, next up, we have uh, 2231 Puppy. Um, so I will pass it over to you. All right, so I'd love to give a hug report to Katni for the advice on whether or not to add my board to the CircuitPython repo. And a group hug, because honestly, this is the best tech community that I'm in, and I'm in a lot of tech communities. Awesome. That is so great to hear. Thanks. Uh, next up is Dan. OK, so uh, thanks to Dave Putz, who fixed uh, a couple of Pulsat bugs uh, in the last seven days. That's really appreciated. He's quite an expert on Pulsat right now. Thanks to Jeff, Katni, and Deshipu um, for discussing. I sort of had a brainstorming session about an API for uh, disabling and enabling the status bar and proposed some things, and we talked about that. That was very helpful to have a sounding board for that. And thanks to TLU, who found a BLE regression in 7xx and did some testing to narrow down what the problem was, and then I uh, made a fix and they tested it and that was extremely helpful. It all happened really fast and that's going in that fix is going into 733 Okay, that's it Thank you, Dan uh, Next up is David G who I will read. Uh, David G has hug report for Neradoc and Dan for helping me report uh, reporting a potential issue with Circup, Bluetooth and the LYWSD 03 MMC uh, and then another hug report to Dan again for helping with firmware building uh, on Espressif. And then next up, I will send it over to Jeff. Hello. Uh, I want to start off with a group hug and then a hug in advance to Dan, uh, who is going to help me plan and brainstorm when the PyCow stuff gets complicated. I don't know a lot about sockets and SSL, so it feels a little daunting right now. And hugs to Tammy Makes Things and to you, Tim, for working on this new live Discord event that I think you've settled on the name of Office Hours for that. Looking forward to hearing more about how that's going to go. And thanks, Jeff. Uh, next up is Katni. Thanks, Tim. So first up from last week, uh, hug to Neradoc for providing me with MDNS CircuitPython code to work with. Um, to Paul Cutler and Keith the EE for trying to help me out with Wi-Fi code, though I think I wanted it to do something it can't. Um, and to Dan for troubleshooting Deep Sleep with me on the Feather ESP32 V2. To Toddbot for putting together send and receive examples using UDP in CircuitPython for me. To Tammy Makes Things and Tectric for joining the community moderators team on Discord. Uh, and breaking news to Tammy for joining the CircuitPython librarians review team. Uh, as well uh, to Tammy and Tectric again for agree agreeing to coordinate and host the CircuitPython office hours and to everyone who's been involved in the planning discussion, as well as the folks who will be volunteering their time to help out. And a group hug. Excellent. Thank you, Katni. Uh, next up is Keith DEE, who is text only, so I'll read. Um, let's see, we have hug report. Uh, I was away last weekend from the end of CircuitPython day through Tuesday of last week, so a belated hug to Tectric for organizing the code sprints, and to Tammy Makes Things, Bishipu, and Mark Gambler for participating and bouncing ideas off of. Uh, hug report to Katni for helping organize CircuitPython day, as well as Paul Cutler for hosting. And hug report to Dan H, Foamy Guy, and everyone involved in all facets of the day. Uh, I'm a week late and don't have the sheet of names, but hugs all around. Excellent. So thank you to Keith for all of those. Uh, and then next up is Kmatch. 
Hey, thanks, Tim. Uh, thanks to, to you first for organizing and completing the Hack Tablet giveaways. Uh, and thanks to everybody that was interested in Andrew. Uh, second, uh, thanks to Fury for some discussions on optimizing the frame rates on dis the display for the Hack Tablet. And last, uh, I ran across some good documentation that the Espressive team has added to the ESP IDF code uh, related to the RGB LCD peripheral. So thanks for that. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Nice. Thank you, Kimmich. Uh, let's see. Next up, I just... Wrong tab. There we go. Next up is uh, Maker Melissa. Hello. Uh, I want to give a hug to Dan H. for reviewing my huge pull request of new boards on circuitpython.org and a group out to everyone else. Excellent. Thank you, Melissa. Next up is Mark Gambler, uh, who is text only, uh, likely. Thinking, yeah, probably like text only. Uh, Mark has a group hug for everyone. Uh, next up after that is going to be Paul Cutler. The Circuit Python show turns six months old later this week, so a big group hug to everyone who's listened, guested, and supported the show. That's amazing to hear. Thanks, Thanks Paul. Uh, next up is Tammy Makes Things. Hey, everybody. So I have um, hugs for Tim, Foamy Guy, for hosting today. Um, to Katni, Tectric, and everyone else working on the Circuit Python office hours. Um, a hug to Tectric for starting grad school. Congratulations. And a group hug. Awesome. Thank you, Tammy. Uh, and next up, and rounding out the hug report section is Tectric, who is text only, so I'll read. Um, hug report for everyone involved in getting the new CircuitPython office hours proposal going. Hug report to everyone in the community and development team. Uh, my first grad, grad course is in microprocessors and embedded systems, something I never would have thought of taking a couple years ago. And lastly, a group hug to everyone. So thank you to Tectric for submitting those hug reports. Uh, and that gets us to the end of the Hug Reports section. So next up will be the Status Updates section. Status Updates is our time to sync up on what we're doing. Uh, I will start, then we'll go through the list alphabetically and give everyone a chance to participate. When I call on you, take a couple of minutes, talk about what you've been doing since the last meeting and what you'll be, be up to uh, until the next meeting. This is also an opportunity to provide tips and tricks uh, relevant to what people are working on. If a discussion does become too long for status updates, we can always move it down to the in the weeds section that follows. So I will get us going on status updates. Uh, last week, I did the final uh, selections for the Hack Tablet giveaway. Uh, on Friday evening, that was. I did quite a bit of PR testing and reviews. Uh, the one that stood out um, that was kind of most interesting, um, something that I hadn't worked on as much before, was the LSIM 303 accelerometer. Uh, but there were several others in the mix as well last week. Um, the other main thing I got done last week is updating the cookie cutter PR that I put in before. Um, this one adds conditionals to the logic so that the actions bot will um, only print the file size if those conditions are true. There's a couple of different like um, measurements that it has to surpass in order to leave the comment. Otherwise, it won't comment if it's not a very big change. And uh, we can, of course, customize all those however we want. Um, this week, I am planning to try to finish up the 3D model at least enough to get my first uh, first draft print, if you will, of a um, handheld gaming device that's made from a Pi Portal and a Joy Featherwing. Uh, even though it's made for a feather, I'm going to try to stick that Joy Featherwing down below a Pi Portal and then have a 3D printed case all around it. Hold everything together. Um, and then uh, the other thing I know for sure that I wanted to try to get in this week is record and publish the next video uh, in the Minecraft Feather RP2040 instructions playlist. So I started putting out these videos last week, um, and the one I want to get in this week is the one that will show you how to load CodePy onto your Feather, as well as initialize the USB uh, serial connection inside of Minecraft and setting up the pins um, to sync back and forth to the real feather. Um, so that's the video I'd like to try and get out this week. Um, next up for status updates is 2231 Puppy. All right, so last week I finished up uh, the design work on my digital fidget board, the eFidget, and this week I have to assemble said digital fidget board and test it. That's awesome. Thank you uh, for sharing. 
2231 puppy. Um, if you do have a chance, uh, if there's a link or anything, drop the link. I'm definitely a fidgeter. I'm always on the lookout for uh, interesting things to play with. Um, next up, though, I will send it over to Dan. Okay, thanks. So uh, I'm about to release uh, CircuitPython 7.3.3. I just pressed the button to make the release. And so after it finishes building, uh, you'll you'll be able to see it in circuitpython.org, and there'll be something in the Adafruit blog about it. This has several new and backported fixes that were kind of seemed like they were sufficiently important to get into 7.3.3, and some of the a few of the fixes are also going to move forward into 8.0. Otherwise, I'm continuing to fix various bugs for 8.0, and um, also um, because we're having trouble with Thani right now on um, when the status bar shows a certain an error. Uh, it's made it clear that maybe we should have an API for uh, enabling and disabling the status bar, which the status bar can appear in your serial terminal and would appear on the title bar there, or it could appear on an attached display. So I've just added some um, Boolean uh, properties to be able to turn it on and off. And I'm debugging that right now. That should go in pretty soon. Okay, that's it. Thank you, Dan. Uh, next up is David G, who I will read. Um, David G says, let's see, checking, uh, checking, boards that uh, checking board that pretends to have a display on circuitpython.org, trying to find a definition. Uh, see in the weeds, so it'll be a topic to discuss that a bit more later on. Uh, new attempt at doing something useful with my temperature sensor, uh, LYWSD03MMC. Uh, let's see there. Followed the guide on compiling CircuitPython and successfully rebuilt uh, the QtPy UF2. Um, and then we have a couple items related to the LilyGo T Watch 2020 V3, which is a ESP32 device um, in the CircuitPython related world. Uh, installing Espressif SDK, compiling CircuitPython for other ESP32 boards, uh, considering the possibility to port CircuitPython to the watch, checking what components already have a CircuitPython library, and then comparing versions 1, 2, and 3 of the watches for pin usage. Uh, and there is a link here to a GitHub gist if anyone is interested in more details on this. Um, in the non-CircuitPython side of things, there it says, uh, let's see, checking MicroPython firmware availability and trying to compile, checking how to add a board to Whippersnapper, and compiling and flashing the HackWatch, which is a BLE, uh, Wi-Fi, and IR hacking device. Um, and that one also has a link out to GitHub for that HackWatch if you're interested. Uh, next up, I will send it over to Jeff, uh, Jeff to tell us about what he's been up to. All right, well, I was just typing that making the first wristwatch compatible with Whippersnapper would be a pretty cool feather in your cap for whoever does that. So I say go for it. Uh, but anyway, the last week, uh, not CircuitPython, but uh, QMK did one of their feature updates over the weekend. And now there is lots of RP2040 goodness in the easily usable version of QMK. I tried to figure out the mystery of the ESP32 eye flakiness, but I didn't really figure anything out. So I am setting that aside for now as ESP32 S3 is the focus of the camera activity in CircuitPython. And I wrote some new guide, new pages for the camera guide on learn.adafruit.com, but those aren't published yet. Hopefully those will be published this week. Um, this week, also, my work will be to work on the Pi Cow, the Pico W. I guess I should have listed it in last week. I, did I skip that? Uh, the Pi Cow is blinking its LED, which means communication with the Wi-Fi part is working, and at least some, uh, to at least some extent. Um, so next up is to make it usable the LED as a digital I/O, and after that, some very simple thing that proves the Wi-Fi chip is actually working for Wi-Fi, such as listing access points or reading the firmware version or just anything um, that kind of progresses. And just to note, I will be out on Tuesday. Thank you. Nice. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, next up, we will hear from Katni. Um, I have two belated hug reports that I thought of as other people were talking. Um, <clears throat> Thanks to Melissa for finding the ESP32 v2 on circuitpython.org when the rest of us couldn't. Um, it turns out it's there. We were just not typing the exact string for the title. 
And uh, belated hug report to Dan for giving me a build without the CircuitPython status bar enabled of CircuitPython so I could continue working on my project and for working on a way to disable it in code. All right, last week, I published the ESP32 S3 TFT feather guide. Turns out we missed that one in the first uh, sweep when those came out, so that's now done. Uh, picked up the ESP32 V2 feather and began digging into the various Wi Fi workflow options uh, intended for a guide on building a Wi Fi mailbox notifier. Found a bug with CircuitPython and Thani where Thani locks up when an exception is thrown by code. Turned out to be related to the status bar. Um, as I said, Dan provided a CircuitPython build with the status bar disabled, and Thani works as intended again. Uh, spent more time in the Wi-Fi workflow trying to get into a habit with it because the native USB workflow is so ingrained into me at this point. Spent time looking into Wi-Fi data sending options and narrowed it down to MDNS, HTTP, or UDP. Um, sorting out, I sorted out working on two Wi-Fi microcontrollers at the same time using two instances of Thani and also sorted out a way to identify which feather was which. Um, turns out I was meant to use Adafruit IO for this project and only one feather, so the Wi-Fi data discussions are info for my brain for future projects. Uh, I got working code going that sends uh, switch notifications and battery voltage to Adafruit IO from the feather V2. Um, tested deep sleep, got excited because the PPK graph looked like I had deep sleep working until I zoomed in and found out it was still pulling light sleep numbers. Turns out it may be an issue with CircuitPython pulling all pins high when they used to float um, when going into deep sleep, or who knows. Um, Dan's planning on taking a look when he's through his current mission. This week, uh, I started on the mailbox notifier guide. There's nothing in it yet, but the, you know, except fe featured uh, products. Um, I will be assuming the deep sleep issue will be resolved and moving forward with the guide. Uh, the main uh, mailbox notifier that will be in the, the, the first thing showcased in the guide will be the Wi-Fi version. Um, but this all came out of my original LoRa version. Um, and I will be uh, including the LoRa version in the guide as well. So there's going to be two, two options there. Um, I'm going to redo the existing code from my previous project to work on two feathers because it was a feather and a pie. Uh, but I'm still going to include the pie code without explanation for folks who have extra pies sitting around already uh, and probably some miscellaneous. And that's what I've got. All right. Thank you, Katni. Uh, next up, we will hear from Kmatch. Okay, thanks, Tim. Uh, my work continues on the bowling detector slash training aid. Uh, and last week made some progress. I actually proved that the ultrasonic uh, distance sensors does have a capability for the resolution and speed that I need to capture the distance to fast moving spheres. And also demonstrated the position indicator. And I'll drop a quick video in the, the chat. Uh, this week, I need to make this uh, more cohesive and portable. So I'm uh, in the process of designing and need to test out the initial mechanical design. I also need to improve the accuracy some by s better smoothing the data and weeding out noise. So that's this week. Thanks. Nice. Thank you, Kmatch. Uh, next up, we will hear from maker Melissa. Hello. So last week, I submitted a huge PR to add about 15 missing CircuitPython and Blinka boards on CircuitPython.org, as well as going through and updating some feature names on Blinka boards. I worked on code.circuitpython.org mostly. I ended up reworking the file dialog a bit in order to add uploading, downloading, and file folder renaming. I also added dialog layering, so now over 4,000 uh, dialogs can be stacked up if needed, and increasing this number would be trivial, but likely I'll never be more than a few deep in practice. Uh, I replaced the hterm component with xterm, so it's now compatible with Firefox. Uh, a lot of miscellaneous uh, small bugs, and I added a bug fix to circuit Python core to add some missing web workflow acceptable cores headers. And I started working on adding device discovery. This week I'm going to continue working on that, and then I will work on a feature to allow, or at least I'm going to try and uh, work on a feature to allow transferring the work 
uh, when jumping between devices and uh, add more file dialog features and then uh, update some components that are starting to age from when we originally had it set up for just doing Bluetooth, smooth out the overall flow, and just lots of testing and more bug fixes, probably. And that's it. Excellent. Thank you, Melissa. Next up, we will hear from Tammy Makes Things. Thanks. So last week, I worked on the planning for the first Circuit Python office hours, um, which we'll talk about in the weeds, and on respinning my Circuit Python build environment on my MacBook because it mysteriously seemed to have stopped working in the last few weeks. So I hopefully have that sorted out. This week, I'm going to finish getting that working. Um, I'm rearranging my schedule so I have more time for Circuit Python stuff. So I'm going to do some. PR reviews, and learning how to use the mod functions on Discord. Um, I also want to do a little bit of research into audio processing with CircuitPython, because I have a project idea for making a guitar effects pedal for my ukulele that's powered by CircuitPython, and I want to figure out if it's feasible. Um, and then non-CircuitPython related, I built a not-to-scale prototype of a tensegrity table out of popsicle sticks. I want to refine this design and build another prototype or two to work out some issues. And then at some point, I'm planning to build a full-size Tensegrity coffee table with wood structural parts and either steel cables or ropes. So that'll be interesting and fun, and it's been fun to learn about that. So that's what I got. Awesome. Thanks, Tammy. Yeah, that sounds really cool. Those are always uh, fun things to kind of just look at and ponder. A couple of those in my life, so that sounds really cool. Um, next up is Tectric, who's text only, so I'll read. Uh, Tectric says, Whoop, last week uh, fixed multiple Wi-Fi network connectivity issues with the portal-based library, uh, removed the LSM303 library uh, from the bundle. I believe that one was replaced by some newer, uh, smaller libraries that implement the different sections of that device. So this was the older deprecated one being removed. Um, added the GUVX I2C library to the Adafruit bundle. Uh, let's see, made RTD, uh, read the docs, documentation, use a range of years up to the current for the copyright attribution. Uh, reviewed a lot of type annotation PRs. Proposed a few cookie cutter and Adabrot patches and updates. Uh, and then Tectric has for this week, uh, finish up the cookie cutter PR, run the Adabot patches proposed once they are approved. Uh, propose a few more patches needed for the libraries. Fix up a few new libraries before adding them to the bundle and also starting grad school classes this week. Uh, excellent, so thank you to Tectric, and of course, congratulations on starting school. Um, and that gets us to the end of the status update section. So the final section for today's meeting is in the weeds. Uh, just a reminder, in the weeds is an opportunity for more long form discussions. These can either come out of status updates or have been identified ahead of time. If you do have any in the weeds topics and you have not already added them, do please go ahead and uh, drop those in down at the bottom of the notes doc. That way we don't necessarily have to wait at the end uh, to see if there are more topics. Um, and then we will just go down the topics uh, in the order that they do appear in the document. And so first up uh, in the weeds topic, we have Tammy. You want to tell us about your topic? Sure. So I just wanted to... Um, give a little bit more information and a heads up about the Circuit Python office hours. Um, what we're intending for this to be is kind of a space where newcomers can come and ask questions and have some like support and know that there are people there in a kind of friendly and non -intim intimidating context that can help with questions and getting people started and set up and like that kind of stuff. Um, the current plan is that the first office hours is going to be on September 10th, and we're tentatively planning from 8 to 10 a.m. Eastern time, although we plan over time to move it around and have some office hours on different times and time zones so that more people can be included. And the current plan is that we're going to probably do the office hours on Discord and probably the Discord video, and then record those and upload them to the Adafruit uh, YouTube channel rather than trying to stream on the Adafruit stream. So that's the plan. 
And if people are interested in volunteering um, to be there and answer questions so that we can have more people and cover more time zones and more flexible scheduling, um, please let Tech Trick or myself know and we'll invite you to the to the plan or join the planning thread. I don't think it's private. Um, but we definitely want to have as many people as are interested in participating, participate. Yeah, this is great news. Thank you, Tammy, for um, highlighting that. And of course, thank you to everyone else who's been involved in coordinating. And yeah, as mentioned, if anybody does want to help get involved um, by being available, um, during the office hours to help uh, newer folks, um, definitely feel free to join the um, the thread on Discord there. Uh, let's see here. The next one we have, let me see, lost my place here. Okay, the next item we have in the weeds is for uh, from David. Um, and it is at David's text only, so I'll read. Um, and it boils down to what is or is not a display um, in CircuitPython, and it's trying to resolve some issues. Oh, I am gone, apparently. David's item because we've kind of been talking back and forth in the text document. So David asks, what is or is not a display in circuitpython.org and goes on to list an issue and three PRs that they're trying to resolve. So uh, it is a brainstorming question and some of the corner cases are the Pew Pew 8x8, the Pico ED and the Mixgo CE, all of which have kind of LED grid displays, uh, something called the DF Robot Beetle which doesn't actually have a display, but has a connector for a display. And then finally, the Hub75 style matrix. And um, this has been a little bit cons inconsistent up to now. And uh, David is just trying to bring a little consistency to the, um, to the designation on circuitpython.org. So I had responded in the document, a display is something that uses display I.O. David asks, can you make a one LED display IO? And I suggested that if you believe it would be useful, then feel free to do so. I hope you wouldn't do it just to prove a point. Um, and with that, I would invite anybody else who has an opinion to just go ahead and chime in. Well, for the Hub 75 displays, I think we should remove them since they don't actually have the display on the board. So for you, having the display built in is important. And for instance, the uh, build of CircuitPython for the Circuit Playground that supports the gizmo displays would have display removed because that's a... Yeah, it's really a gray area here, which is the whole thing, because it's like, for instance, like the Beetle, it looks like it's specifically meant to be have a display added to it, but it doesn't actually have a display itself. It just has the connector, so maybe it should be removed from that as well. Is it? Does this so type should, should there be a separate category that's like? I, I think maybe that's where. External display meant to be used with an external display, you know. So, mm. the hub 75 hub 75 refers to the connector on on some of the uh, uh LED matrixes, yes. doesn't it? Yeah, it's so not, that's a display, it's just not attached, it's, to not, the it's actually a display, it's not a di it's not a uh de device. Right, and we just don't, we don't want to have like thirty different features either. We want to keep kind of keep it limited to, on the list. So that's the other would it make, side of this. Would it make sense? Yeah, if you create, create a monster. You wind up creating a monster uh, uh, selection list. Eh. A select uh, combo box. 
Would it make sense if the feature name was display IO instead of displays more generally? And then the cutoff point is the ones that support display IO, which would cover the gizmo. Um, we seem to have lost sound. We're still here, Charles. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I, I think I would say like, yeah, you want to say like, I mean, I, I think it's good to know which ones have an onboard display. And you could even say like onboard display or something like that. And you could, or, and the other ones could say offboard display support or something like that. External display support. Yeah. So I think both those, both those things are interesting. Um, Although almost anything with STEM QT and which isn't so constrained that it has display I.O. configured out would count as that. Well, I, I, I'm thinking about specific display hardware. Yeah, but in which so, case... So there's has a display and there's designed for a display. Yeah, that's exactly the phrasing I was thinking of. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Or meant for use with an external display. That's kind of wordy, but um, like display included or intended for use with external display. Yeah, yeah, a less yeah, wordy than like that. that. Yeah, something like that, right? So okay, well then that leaves non-display I/O items like the Pew Pew eight by eight, which I don't think uses display I/O. Would that be listed? Yeah, I would call those things a display. Exactly, because that's how they're used. Yeah, you know, and the, and yeah, uh, Cadney's just LED display. display. That's an option. Yeah, uh, it depends how many properties we want, or you know, how many additional features we want to add to the list. Which I think adding I one is okay, probably. I, I I think just saying that there's I right. I think I think whether or not it's display I/O, I think that's less important than the fact that the board the board has an on there's an onboard display or it's meant to be used with a display and those are the two sort of the two categories not can be used with a display that's sort of true of every board but right yeah so yeah they, they then, right, would probably be um onboard display then yeah designed for use with an external display yeah so something like that yeah so yeah it's just it's just not cut and dry it's just yeah. going to kind of be like we have to use our judgment on it. Uh, David, if you feel like you understood what we discussed and if you don't um, disagree too sharply, can you write that on the issue and then work on those PRs accordingly? All right. And Thank you. That's that's really appreciated. Because um, yeah, it is it is always going to be a little bit hand wavy or a judgment call, as Melissa points out. But asking us to make that judgment call um, rather than let it go is also important. So thank you. And now, uh, assuming Foamy Guy's mic is working again, I'll step back out of the way. Yep, I think we are good here. Uh, it, just to check in, the yep. folks can hear me. Yep. Okay. Um, yeah, thank you, uh, Jeff, for handling that section in the weeds there. Um, that gets us to the end. We have no other in the weeds topics for this week, so we'll have uh, the wrap up next. I will take the last timestamp. Um, so next meeting uh, is one of the relatively rare ones where we are actually going to be bumping uh, a day forward. So the next meeting is on Tuesday, September 6th. 2022 that is 24 hours later than normal so it will still be at 2 p.m eastern 11 a.m pacific but it will be on tuesday september 6th uh, the monday before that the fifth is a uh, u.s holiday so we will be one day later than normal for the next meeting uh, so with that i will say thank you to everyone for participating and we will see you next uh, week on tuesday thanks everyone thanks everyone